So to respond to the critiques about lighting, I increased the lighting on my face because it was not good in the previous podcast, but then the fan creates like a stroboscope effect, so I have to turn off the fan. I don't know if it's still there a little bit, so I don't know where that's coming from. So this is adaptation in r- <laughs> near real time. I have to worry about the quality of podcasts, even though I'm just doing this for fun. I'm not getting paid for this. Okay. We have to revisit the definition of cities themselves. So comparing apples with apples, how this report defines cities. How should a city be defined? This apparently fundamental question has, it turns out, no easy answer. Thus, countries around the world vary widely in how they define cities using both different numbers and different combinations of criteria. For example, Senegal defines cities as agglomerations of 10,000 inhabitants or more, so purely population-based, and Albania defines them as towns and other industrial centers with 400 inhabitants or more. So you can see remarkable difference in the number of (coughs) inhabitants counted based on the background population itself. More generally, although some countries define cities based on only on population, others also define them using criteria such as population density, the presence of certain types of infrastructure and basic services, and the share of their workforce that is employed outside of agriculture. In its official statistical definition, Indonesia even includes the presence of massage parlors and cinemas as some of the factors that help classify a place as urban. A large group of countries has no explicitly stated criteria by which they define cities. Rather, they simply either list their cities by name or designate administrative uh, units that constitute cities. So for countries that are Uh, have high population like India and China, population density can be very disconnected from the infrastructure, basic services. So you can have essentially very crowded villages in terms of services, Uh, either it's internet and uh, basic services, transportation, sanitation, water, etc. So anyway, definition of cities is not unique. Sorry, this figure is a bit fuzzy but we saw it before. In terms of where are we now, this is looking at increasing greenness, decreasing greenness and no data. So there is a lot of decreasing greenness which unfortunately is largely in the Amazon forest region so that's not good news. Uh, Western US, Eastern Central, North US, uh, Eastern Seaboard show some increasing greenness. Surprisingly India shows lots of increasing greenness. This is urban remember. (coughs) And here is China dotted with some decreasing greenness and some increasing greenness uh, as well. Europe largely shows increasing greenness and uh, maybe good news that Sahel uh, here, uh, West Africa shows increasing greenness as well. Comparing levels of social inclusion in urban versus rural areas, the analysis in this report reveals that more populous Urban areas tend to be more inclusive on several indicators, poverty rate, access to various types of basic services, basic health outcomes such as infant mortality and so on. So you have to basically use an index uh, that leverages social sustainability global database recently developed by the uh, World Bank to track uh, levels of social inclusion. Basically comparing different cities, if the definitions are acceptably matched, it gives you a sense uh, or some insights on how one city may be doing in being more uh, or better in social inclusion than other or how one city may be better in uh, social inclusion compared to its surrounding rural areas and so on. So whatever lessons you can learn, you can transfer to elsewhere. So that's the idea of comparing levels of social inclusion. Cities tend to have slightly lower levels of social cohesion than rural areas. This is a finding as well. Although this report focuses on issues of inclusion, a distinct but related concept is that social cohesion, that is a sense of shared purpose, trust and willingness to cooperate among members of a group, between members of different groups and between people and government. 
More cohesive so societies are expected to be better prepared to withstand climate change related shocks, avoid conflict, redistribute income and wealth uh, toward vulnerable and marginalized populations and leave no one behind. Okay, so these are not just anecdotal but there is quantitative uh, information on those things. Looking at uh, some more in where are we now, unhealthy diets and poorly governed food systems for urban consumers. Uh, the demographic and socioeconomic changes associated with urbanization are causing large shifts in dietary and activity patterns. Urban consumers eat more fruits veg and vegetables than rural consumers do but they also consume more processed meats and sugary drinks. Urban consumers with lower socioeconomic status, lower, lower maternal education, have the poorest diets. So what are the summary and conclusions? This chapter has taken stock of how green, how resilient and how inclusive cities globally are today, revealing that many indicators relate to both cities size and its level of development. Although less green in terms of their CO2 emissions, levels of air quality and average vegetation levels, more populous cities are, are in many respects more inclusive, as evidenced by their lower poverty rates, better levels of access to basic services and better average outcomes on many health indicators. Beyond a certain income level, development also correlates with both better air quality and a higher uh, average level of vegetation. Furthermore, more developed cities are more resilient to extreme weather events, the frequency and intensity which of which are, except for extreme cold events, increasing with climate change. So should we then let cities grow and become more prosperous and assume that those that grow either in population density or size tend to become richer, more developed and hence reduce inequalities and become more inclusive and improve other indicators like health, greenness, inclusiveness as well. Well, that's not necessarily uh, implied here because they haven't tracked the growth of a city from small size to medium or large size and so on. They are just comparing large cities to small cities more developed cities to less developed cities, cities to rural areas and so on. Okay, um, should I continue this uh, here? Uh, this podcast is only uh, seven, eight minutes long, so maybe I will continue into the uh, next part, which chapter two, which is still in part one so it is a global typology of cities which we already talked about a little bit so we'll just visit the main findings uh, the quote in this chapter uh, from Ban Ki-moon the previous Secretary General of the United Nations um, climate change does not respect who you are rich, or, uh, rich and poor small and big and the others have said it in a different way that climate change is not gender neutral and so on and so forth. Categories of cities we already looked at in the summary, uh, size and level of development used to define global typologies included low income, middle income, high income in terms of development level, uh, GNI per capita range, so you can uh, look at the numbers here in US dollars, city sizes, small, medium and large. Uh, Population sizes also varied uh, here. What are the main findings? Cities can be usefully classified using a typology of two dimensions, population size and level of development of the country in which they are located. Such a typology distinguishes between nine types of cities, small, medium and large cities in low, middle and high income countries. So three each, so that's nine. Across these nine types of cities, the mix and Severity of greenness, resilience and inclusiveness challenges vary widely. Likewise, cities vary in both the mix and the severity of climate change related hazards they will face in the next two decades. So again, risk comes from uh, hazard, vulnerability, exposure and now also response. 
and resilience is about how quickly you recover after a climate shock or a perturbation. Looking forward to 2030 to 2040, cities in low-income countries and large cities worldwide will more likely have greater exposure to climate change related hazards. Exposure here has to be understood clearly that it depends on population density, infrastructure and so on. Thus, although cities in middle and high income countries are responsible for the bulk of the world's urban carbon dioxide emissions, cities in low income countries, if not well prepared, will likely bear the brunt of climate change. So you have to uh, worry about the current risk uh, or the typology of the city and then what it uh, faces going into the future with continued global warming. Small island developing states in the Caribbean and the Pacific are projected to be worst position, positioned to withstand climate change related hazards in part because they cannot adapt, with, uh, adapt through internal migration. Small islands, you cannot run away anywhere. In big countries on land, you can be internally displaced to deal with climate change. Although the quality and breadth of climate data have improved dramatically in recent decades, high levels of uncertainty and coverage gaps on more local scales highlight the importance of further investments in information on the climate change related risks that cities globally face. Such information is an indispensable input into better policy making. In the World Bank uh, report on adaptation principles in facilitating people and firms to adaptation, we had the importance of data and risk information uh, to, you know, to uh, facilitate better adaptation by people and uh, firms. So we are reiterating this here in the context of cities. Okay, so this is the summary of global typology of cities, country level income, we already looked at it, city size, so high income, upper middle income, low income, lower middle income and small, medium and large cities. And these are the numbers we already looked at in terms of number of cities, uh, medium per capita GDP income and five Post, uh, most populous cities worth reading Pirganj in Bangladesh, Plaiku in Vietnam, Baraut in India, Turbat in Pakistan, Siluguri, uh, sorry, Siuguri, Siguiri in uh, Guinea, and medium and large here, large, Jakarta, Indonesia, Delhi, India, Dhaka, Bangladesh, Mumbai, India, uh, Kujon City, Manila, Philippines. Surprising, none of the Chinese cities show up here so we have to be careful about that uh, I'll come back and continue this idea of cities in a in the next podcast so we will leave this here and continue in the next podcast okay